Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's a fine morning here in St. Louis. It is. It is a good one. It's so good to be back. I, you know, have, I feel like we haven't recorded in a while. This is my first episode back since coming from Houston. It, I know. I kind of have missed it. Maybe missed you even a little bit. Uh, yeah, right, right. Sure. You would have <laughs> called if you actually missed me. You probably just missed the podcast uh, experience. I thought about you all the time. Right, right. <laughs> Well, that was really great having, um, you know, we had a couple of guests recently. We had Macy and Jeff and Steve, and we hope that those will be um, recurring episodes or, you know, um, types of episodes, and we hope that everybody enjoyed them. Um, Chuck, we have a, a couple of great reviews that were recently posted. Um, uh, here's the first one. It's from uh, a listener named Andrew. Um, it's five-star review, only kind you're allowed to leave. Informative and fun is the subject line. Perfect. Dr. Goldfarb and Dr. D, a.k.a. Chuck and Chris, please. Thank you for your awesome podcast. It's both educational and fun. I appreciate that you cover topics from patient evaluation to operative pearls to practice development. Thank you for your time and effort. Andrew, thank you for leaving that review. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, we love our listener community. And thank you to all of you for going on the iTunes page, clicking five stars, leaving a review, and maybe leaving a question for Chuck. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, it is interesting whenever I think that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of our listeners. You know, we have a large number of listeners that does seem to be continuing to inch up. Um, and there are a lot, you know, it, it's always interesting to me that there are a number of hand surgeons. I went, recently went to a fellowship reunion and I would say three quarters of the room had no idea I did a podcast, um, which why would they, I guess, if they're not podcast people and I, they're all good friends, but I don't see them on a daily basis. So, it's super interesting. So, uh, you know, if this is useful, please tell a friend. So wait, hold on. What about the quarter that did know that you did a podcast? I, I well, <laughs> some of them knew we did a podcast and didn't necessarily listen regularly. And there was a core group of listeners who really seemed to enjoy it. Listen, if one out of four hand surgeons read any paper that I wrote, I'd be thrilled. So <laughs> I'll take what we've got going here and hopefully we can continue to grow it. That is fair. That is fair. So uh, let's hold maybe the second review because I don't know if I can handle too much uh, positivity this early in the morning. And maybe you had a great idea for a, re a recurring segment trying to give structure to our podcast. Yes, yeah, structure is nice. I'm amazed that you and I made it about 18 months without structure, <laughs> given our personalities. Maybe this is the only unstructured space in our lives. Um, but I thought it'd be really fun to talk about our hardest cases you know, of recent memory. So what about if we asked... Um, you know, and I'd also be great if listeners wanted to send in their hard cases. Um, and if there's any kind of obviously HIPAA compliant way to talk about it, we'd love to kind of talk through a case. But Chuck, have you had anything interesting come your way or something that became interesting? Yeah, I thought of when we discussed this segment, I was, you know, immediately thinking about cases um, that would be appropriate to discuss. And a couple came to mind. But you know, given your interest in nerve, and apparently the listeners enjoy nerve, I'm not really sure why. Um, I thought a good, challenging nerve case would be a nice place to start. All right. Well, uh, put me on the hot seat here. So, okay, for the listeners, I have no idea what Chuck is about to present. So, <laughs> let's see what let's see what he's got. All right. So, here's the background. I have a 33 year old injured worker with cubital tunnel syndrome. I treated this patient seven years ago with a subcutaneous ulnar nerve transposition, and she did really well. Her preoperative symptoms at that time were relatively classic. She had discomfort at the medial elbow. She actually had an unstable nerve, and she intermittently had numbness and tingling in her fingers. She failed conservative treatment. We did a transposition. She did well and disappeared. She has continued to work in the same occupation and she was uh, at work and she does a physical job and was struck in the anterior medial elbow uh, about six months ago. And since that time has had really intense nerve type pain, burning pain, primarily at the elbow, but radiating to the fingers. And so that's what she presented with when she came back to the office, say, six months ago. So I guess I would stop there and maybe ask how you process this and what your examination might look like for a patient such as this. 
Well, so, I mean, this is the thing about a subcutaneous transposition. It takes a subcutaneous nerve and just moves it to a different subcutaneous position. Perhaps now when it's anteriorly transposed, it's still, um, it's less vulnerable to the, um, to the traction across the medial epicondyle and is less prone to ergonomic issues as it sits kind of where people rest their, um, their arm. Um, but it's still prone to trauma. It's not, you know, deeply positioned. Um, and in the setting of something like a known um, traumatic event, I guess you have to try the, the things that we all want to try first. Um, so if it's more of a pain component, um, I would consider starting something like um, uh, gabapentin or pregabalin. Um, although I recognize those medications are no fun for patients um, in a, from a personal perspective. Once my mother-in-law started gabapentin and I heard about the side effects, I honest, honestly, my prescribing patterns changed a little bit. It's, it's a tough medicine to titrate up. It's a tough medicine for a patient to titrate. Some people fly through it, have no problem, but you definitely have to tell them about the side effects, um, particularly the somnolence, just the abnormal way that they feel. Um, pregabalin um, is a good alternative. I know that you know other people who like nerves, like Dr. McKinnon, that's one of her go-to medications. It used to be super expensive. I believe it's generic now. Um, you know, so that does change things a bit. Um, but I typically would start with that. And then also with um, a visit to one of our expert therapists. Okay, so a bunch of questions. Uh, well, let's start with what you said last. So what would you ask from the therapist? And what is your goal with therapy? Are you buying time? Or do you honestly think therapy is going to make this patient better? I think that the risk of benefit ratio on therapy is, is fantastic. You know, so if therapy, if the time that the therapist spends with the patients, A, it's an extra set of eyes and ears in a situation that is not normal. B, the expertise they can provide in helping to quiet down that nerve through local modalities, um, stretches, um, you know, uh, honestly, a hand to hold sometimes is also really helpful. Um, and then I'll, the other thing I would do is probably limit some of the work-related activities if it's possible. And this is where you have more, much more expertise than I do in terms of how to handle this situation in the context of work comp. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. I would uh, I would say a couple of things. You know, uh, I've been taking care of injured workers for my entire career, and there has been some evolution. But patience is not often um, part of the equation from the work from the you know the workers' comp side. And so, a long duration of therapy uh, probably not okay. I think it would be reasonable for the first month or so. I follow these patients monthly to try some therapy. I don't think that would be shot down necessarily, um, but I don't think we we could expect a long duration of therapy. Um, and you're right, you could put some restrictions on for sure. But once again, how long that would be tolerated by the employer, I don't know. The second thing I would say is, so interestingly, this patient had experience um, with gabapentin and it was not a good experience and refused to consider that medication. Um, I'm not a huge believer for the reasons you said. I've had some patients with adverse events. What is the role, if any, of steroid medication? Um, you know, I, I, for this particular situation, I do not like a steroid injection. And I've talked, I think, with some of our trainees in the past about why we don't use steroids in general for cubital tunnel, um, while we may use it for uh, carpal tunnel. They're different disease processes. You know, in carpal tunnel, there's swelling within the carpal tunnel in structures like tendons and your goal is to try to quiet the swelling in that um, in that small confined space whereas in cubital tunnel say the nerve is actually in situ there's not a swollen structure you know the the nerve is experiencing traction um, as it as the elbow flexes um, so it's traction and compression and you know the, the nerve itself is swollen and i don't love the idea of putting a ton of steroid or local anesthetic around nerves in general um, and then for the transposed nerve, this would not, uh, I don't think it would provide a long-term uh, relief. Um, I, I guess you could make an argument maybe to try it once, um, but to me, it's not going to be something where that's going to be the thing that cures her, gets her back to work and keeps her out of your office, uh, you know, going forward. You did. Perfect. So you have taught me well. Um, I did not offer steroids. I did offer uh, nerve modulating medication, which patient did not want. And we sent her to therapy with some mild activity restrictions. She comes back a month later, not better, honestly, probably a little worse um, with continued pain as I guess I would say the primary complaint with secondary complaints of, of numbness and tingling in the fingers 
and weakness. On exam, two-point discrimination, and this is static two-point, which is my preferred modality, was five millimeters diffusely. Uh, intrinsic hand strength was good. Uh, the nerve was clearly highly irritated on my examination. So we're now about, let's say, 10 weeks after this trauma, have failed four weeks of therapy and anti-inflammatories, and now she is back in your office. What's next? So, I mean, I guess to summarize, the way I would think about this is a mechanically irritated, likely swollen nerve without any advanced signs of, um, of ulnar neuropathy on examination in terms of motor and sensory. But the fact that the nerve is highly sensitive and irritable kind of pushes us towards considering operative treatment. Um, you know, some listeners would have probably said, why didn't you get a nerve study from the get-go? I think that would be fine to get a nerve study from the get-go. I think it's probably time to get it now. Okay. Um, thank you. And that's exactly what we did. And I would like to know what you do routinely in these situations, because it might be somewhat different. I, you know, ordered a nerve conduction study with an EMG, and we also got an ultrasound. I do not always get ultrasound. Do you, and ultrasound was helpful in this case, but do you feel that ultrasound is now in your practice essentially always indicated? Um, I think so. I mean, some of it is me learning when to use ultrasound. It is in the non-revision setting, in the primary ulnar neuritis cubital tunnel setting, I think it is useful because it can help provide some clarity to two things. Uh, for the quote, electrodiagnostically negative uh, cubital tunnel syndrome, but there is some swelling in the nerve. I think there's something to be said about that um, because perhaps enough of the nerve quote fibers are working um, so that the nerve study comes back normal, at least on the conduction velocities and likely on the amplitude. And for that early stage kind of disease, there probably aren't gonna be any signs of denervation on the EMG and the ultrasound may show some swelling. The second thing as we've talked about in the past with it being, for it being useful is, you know, the fact that it can help you in terms of accurately diagnosing subluxation of the nerve. Now in the setting, uh, and that's why, for those two reasons, um, that's why I pretty much always, if it's available um, through the, you know, through the physiatrist um, or electrodiagnostician who's doing the exam, we'll get an ultrasound. Um, some could make the argument, why don't you just transition only to ultrasound? And that's a whole different topic. Um, in this setting, it is incredibly helpful to have the information as to how swollen the nerve potentially is. Um, and honestly, in some cases, and, and not in this case, because I know that you did the first surgery, but sometimes you want to make sure the nerve has actually been transposed. That is not always the case. Uh, and I've, I've been told by patients that they had their nerve transposed. I've looked at their incisions and said that's way too small. Uh, and the nerve is actually not transposed. I think that's fair. And I am a, um, I'm a real believer in really small incisions, but uh, I'm going to repeat that because I dinged. I'm a believer in really small incisions, but this is one surgery where a little bit longer incision training makes a lot of sense because what I really want to avoid is the nerve not running the straightest course possible. And so I agree with you. I think understanding what was truly done in a first surgery matters. So let's be honest. So we all know that the the skin around the um around the medial elbow is very compliant. There's a lot of pliability within that. And yes, you can. Technically, you can transpose the ulnar nerve through a really small incision. But what happens when you do that is uh, exactly what you stated is that you not, do not get the nerve going in the straightest line possible. You end up getting kind of an omega sign on that nerve. I think that's John Isaacs that told me that term or a Z sign as I think Dr. McKinnon calls it, um, where the nerve will be transposed to the front of the elbow. But then as you get, as it comes back down or it comes back uh, posteriorly, towards that fascia around the intersection of the FCU and the remainder of the flexor pronator fascia, it kinks right there. Um, and that's my issue with small incision ulnar nerve transpositions. I totally agree with you. I didn't know that, you know, I'm not as nerdy in the nerve world as you are. And I don't mean that offensively. I mean that in a yes, complimentary. Yes, you do, Chuck. Yes, you I mean, totally that in a completely fine. complimentary 18, way. 18 months of podcasting, I've become bulletproof to the nerve hating. So... I like the term omega nerve or whatever you said from Jonathan Isaacs, because it really, you know, I, I don't know all the Greek uh, letters, <laughs> but I do know what an omega looks like. Um, I don't know all the fraternity letters either, but I know what an omega looks like, so I can see it. Thank you for sharing that. 
I, I'm so glad we've added something to your knowledge base today, Dr. Goldfarb. <laughs> you have. I love it. I'm going to use it every day now. Um, <laughs> all right. Let me share the nerve study results with you. Um, so the nerve conduction study findings, I'll just hit a few highlights, um, showed that there was normal distal onset latency, amplitude, uh, and conduction velocity, except for a decreased conduction velocity at 40 meters per second across the elbow. Now, so I'm assuming the, you know, I don't put a lot of stock in sensory amplitudes because they're technically so variable. I'm assuming those came back as normal too for the ulnar nerve. They did. They okay. did. And on the EMG part, are there any denervation findings on the FDI or the ADM or any ulnar, if they, I don't know if they checked the ulnar extrinsic musculature. They did not, but they did note that the first dorsal interosseous muscle showed increased motor unit amplitude. Okay, got it. Are there any fibrillations or sharp waves listed? Uh, there were not. Okay, and then is uh, on the recruitment pattern, like that far right column on the EMG, any abnormalities listed in the recruitment pattern for the motor units, the MUAPs? Um, hold on, let me look. <laughs> um, so there are no recruitment uh, pattern abnormalities demonstrated. Okay. So, I mean, to me, based on what you've described, it sounds more like a chronic, uh, the footprint of chronic changes, um, but nothing acute. Um, so I'm not sure how it was uh, interpreted by the electrodiagnostician, but that's based on what you've told me, that's what I would say. So as expected, you are right on the money. You are an expert in this field. Uh, it was interpreted as a chronic ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. And it was noted by ultrasound that the nerve was indeed subcutaneous. Uh, the maximum cross-sectional area of her nerve was 15 meter, uh, millimeters squared versus 10 okay. um, as the normal. Okay. So we have, as you predicted, a large swollen nerve without any really exciting new findings, but with a chronic pattern identified. And so, so let me ask you one more question because I know that it's going to come up. So on your examination, were there any signs of compression at Guillain's Canal? There were not. And I... I I'm not the world's greatest believer in the existence of a Guillain's problem in this situation uh, or distal ulnar tunnel, as I often call it, as influenced by Dr. Gelberman. Um, there were not no, negative tunnels, no type of compressive findings, nothing. Okay. Because I know that there are some listeners, uh, shout out Dr. Rob Gray, uh, who believe that releasing Guillain's in every case is the way to go. I can't remember in which forum we learned that, but... <laughs> But, but here's the question, is it, I, and I, I understand that, is it about releasing a current possible constriction site or is it about releasing in advance of nerve swelling, quote unquote, during the recovery? To speak for those who believe in it, the answer would be yes, as Dr. Boyer would answer it. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Yes, it would be. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that this comes into like where the, to me, work comp kind of comes into the picture here, right? So you want to do, I think, at least the way that I interpret the care of the injured worker is you want to consider doing everything possible for these patients from jump. So to me, this patient looks like they're heading towards a, a revision on their nerve transposition. And then you could make the argument, I think, with reasonable, um, you know, with some uh, good justification to consider releasing the distal on their tunnel. Um, now, one thing that, you know, if, for those that are listening and if you're ordering your nerve studies, it's really hard to diagnose with accuracy um, distal ulnar tunnel compression on a nerve study because you're relying a lot on the, um, on the sensory component of the nerve conduction studies. So oftentimes, if you really want to get elect electrodiagnostic, quote, evidence of um, compression at the distal ulnar tunnel, requesting a contralateral assessment of that particular component can be useful. Now, obviously, you don't want to do more to the patient than you have to, but if you're trying to dial in on that on your nerve study, that is useful. Uh, I would still argue that that is more of a clinical diagnosis um, uh, and maybe a sonographic diagnosis than an electrodiagnostic one. Um, but there are a lot of camps or a lot of thought out there as to whether we're making too big of a deal of releasing a nerve prophylactically and whether the nerve is actively compressed or not. I like that, that's very helpful. And let's be very clear, this is uh, the concept of uh, performing a distal ulnar tunnel decompression 
is level five evidence, but from you know a number of, of really good, um, highly thought of uh, surgeons, but the science doesn't guide us. Now, I think the science would be hard pressed to guide us here. Is that your take? Well, I mean, we're kind of uh, diverging from your case here, but you know, I think that the concept of a, an injured nerve swelling downstream is based in a lot of really good lab-based science. Um, it occurs in rats. Now you make the argument, right? That perhaps what happens in rats doesn't happen in humans. Um, but I, I think that it does occur. Now, whether it reaches the tipping point of actually becoming clinically uh, an issue is a different argument. Now, if you look at the literature in humans for this particular question that you're asking in the setting of ulnar neuropathy, something at the elbow, there isn't great evidence for it. There are a couple of case series. So I'd argue we're pushing into level four evidence um, for uh, the con supporting the concept of distal decompression helping in a setting of a recovery nerve injury. And the two case series I remember are kind of a hodgepodge of various peripheral nerves. So there's nothing truly dialing in on this question of ulnar nerves. So like much in the literature, if you believe in a concept and want to believe it, you can find a paper to support what you believe. If you don't believe in a concept, you can hate on the literature and say there's not enough evidence to support it. Uh, just like you know, all those papers that have been published recently in JBJS about whether or not to fix distal radius fractures, you can find an RCT to support what you want. For sure. So before I tell you what I did, I'm here. If I'm hearing you correctly, and this injured worker, and I'm saying this a little tongue in cheek, you're going to throw the kitchen sink at this patient, and so you are going to perform a submuscular a revision ulnar nerve transposition. You are likely going to perform a distal ulnar tunnel decompression. And are you going to also supercharge that nerve, Dr. D? 100% no on the supercharge. Um, you know, so based, this is the beef I have with some of the supercharging uh, fever is I don't think that is completely rooted in, um, uh, in the indications that were originally described. So some of the prerequisites, as I understand them, and I think I've been taught by Dr. McKinnon on this, that you know, you need to have a nerve um, that is actively crying, or muscles supplied by that nerve that are actively crying for reinnervation. So you need something that is acutely denervated. So you know, you the way you describe the nerve studies when I asked you, are there fibs and sharp waves? There are no fibs and sharp waves here. So this is not an acutely denervated nerve. So supercharging this, that whatever gets to the, um, to the distal ulnar motor component, the distal ulnar motor component is not asking for help. Clinically, the muscles are great. You've described that the intrinsic strength is good. I'm presuming there's no atrophy. Um, so this is something where I don't think you're gonna do a whole lot of good. You've described the motor amplitudes of that ulnar nerve as being normal. This is a healthy nerve. It's just irritated at the elbow and just needs a, to be put in a place where it's not irritable anymore. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So failing time, failing conservative uh, management, including therapy, anti-inflammatories, but not the nerve modulators. Um, and with approval from workers' compensation, the patient was taken to the operating room and a submuscular transposition was performed. This was one of those challenging cases where her scar tissue was overwhelming. Um, and so we use the same incision. I make my incision a little anterior to the middle epicondyle. We found the nerve. We extended our incision. I made a you know reasonable incision to start, but we made it a bit longer. We found healthy nerve proximally, uh, no pathology until we got directly over the flexor pronator mass. And then we encountered scar tissue like we all dread, honestly. And uh, we meticulously dissected and freed the nerve, honestly, with a cuff of some tissue. Um, because I didn't feel there was any reason. It wasn't circumferential, um, but we took uh, some, circum some of the uh, abnormal scarring with the nerve and performed a Z-lengthening of the flexor pronator mass, which you, I'd love your thoughts on, placed the nerve in a nice position submuscularly and um, went about our business. So thoughts? Um, well, A, you have no one else but yourself to blame for that scar because you did the first surgery. <laughs> Amen. It is so true. You know, so I do, um, I do a lot of revision surgery. Uh, it's actually funny. When I was uh, coming out of training, I was talking to Dr. McKinnon about 
the, you know, doing all their nerve transpositions. He's like, oh yeah, don't worry, Chris, you know, you're not going to do any revisions until you're well into your practice. You know, you're just going to be doing primary. So here's how you do a really good primary. And she taught me how to do a great primary ulnar nerve transposition as did all of the other partners uh, at our orthopedic group. And then in my clinic, the stuff that's coming in is all revision on their nerve transpositions, just like anybody, I guess, in an academic practice with a niche. Um, but I, I, you know, I do a fair bit of revision on their nerve surgery, and it's it's always something where I look at the trainee with me. I say, look, I do revisions. Uh, I just, you know, there's so many small little micro decisions that are made um, during the portions of these cases where you're trying to free up the nerve where I know that technically you can probably do this just as well as I, but I want, I don't want you to have any of the responsibility of this. So, or feeling like, you know, something didn't go well. So I, you know, as much as I try to encourage our trainees to, uh, to quote, hold the knife, um, these are cases that I do myself, at least at this point in my career. And um, it's a tough dissection. Um, you know, I think that for the trainees, there's a lot to learn by, you know, watching how to dissect. And I'm, I, at this point, I've evolved to switching between different modalities of dissection for this. I love the leaving the cuff. Um, I don't do this all with tenotomies. You know, I use the, I love the Fisher tenotomies that are out there. They're great. Sometimes I take out an iris tenotomy. Uh, sometimes I use a 15 blade. Sometimes I use a beaver blade. Um, it, it, you just need to be facile in different ways of dissecting. Now, you know, the concept of just spread, spread, spread until things pop open is not the case here because what you don't want to do is piss off that nerve even more. And so wide spreads, you know, spreading quote like a person, like one of our former mentors used to tell us, uh, is not helpful in this particular setting once you've gotten your subcutaneous tissue exposed. I love starting proximally. I love going distally. I don't, I think sometimes going distally can be a little bit more difficult. I like finding the nerve proximal and finding it healthy and then starting rolling with my dissection. Now, if I'm starting to meet some, um, uh, if I'm not making headway in my dissection because I'm caught in scar, then I will pivot and start dissecting out the nerve distally and good tissue just to give myself a way to keep the case moving forward. And as you know, once you've gotten that nerve kind of mobilized proximally and distally and healthy nerve, it's a lot easier to see your planes um, as much as the scar tissue will give you at least. I think that's really well said, um, and certainly how I thought about it, how I approached it. And and do you? Um, this is a little bit of just technical, but do you believe in the Z lengthening, or do you just simply cut the flexor pernator mass and repair it? Well, I, in principle, I go in every case um, to Z lengthen the flexor pronator mass, and then release the flexor pronator or Z lengthen the flexor pronator fascia, and then release the flexor pronator muscle wherever it seems to make sense for the nerve to lie. Now, when you're doing a primary transposition, you you know tend to see where the nerve wants to lie. In a revision case, that nerve has been transposed for however long. It's it tends to know where it wants to sit, and your job is just just to let it sit deeper. So sometimes I'll release, you know, I'll do a, a lengthening of the fascia in the Z manner, um, and then on the muscle, I'll take it right off the medial epicondyle sometimes, or I'll take it just off the medial epicondyle. What I'm trying to avoid now is that that chunk of proximal muscle that's left on the medial epicondyle, potentially acting as an area to create some omega type turns. Um, so I've, I've started more to release it off of the bone itself for the muscle, not for the fascia. Obviously being mindful as you head posterior to, uh, about the um, uh, medial collateral ligament. So I like how you worked that word omega into it. It really- it Just for you. With me. Thank you, thank you. and. Um, do you always find the median nerve with a submuscular and is it your goal to have the ulnar nerve running parallel to the median nerve? So again, to evoke our partner, Marty Boyer, never say never, never say always. I think that's it. Um, but yes, I find the median nerve. I feel better. I <clears throat> listen, uh, nobody's perfect. Um, but given what I do and, um, who I say I am, I'd feel like such a jerk if something happened in the median nerve and I didn't at least look at the median nerve uh, during the case. Cause I know that it is at risk during the muscular release of the, of, for the submuscular transposition. So, you know, let's be honest, you know, a submuscular transposition is a surgery that has pretty substantial morbidity. And, you know, Ryan's shown that in some of his papers um, and it hurts, it bleeds. And these are things that, you know, you need to tell, and I know you do, but you need to tell your patients ahead of time when you're deciding what to do. Um, to me, you know, I still, you know, the three options for a primary case or an in situ 
decompression, a subcutaneous transposition, and a submuscular. And I try to guide them through what each of those surgeries will feel like based on what patients have told me. And then I'll tell them what I think they need based on their nerve. Um, so it is not entirely shared decision making, but I do like to emphasize that a submuscular, um, while it is the most definitive, does carry some uh, morbidity with it. Perfect. So as we kind of wrap this up, I, one final question. So you told me that it was my fault that the patient made a lot of scar tissue with the first surgery. So how am I going to mitigate that with the second surgery? So when do you start therapy? Because that's the only thing I know to do is get that nerve gliding. How do you approach the post? Listen, course? everybody's nerve scars. You know, the, 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 when I went on my diatribe about starting and doing revision surgery more than primary surgery, my point was, I'm sure I'm going to be revising some of my own surgeries in the next five to 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, I will have nobody but myself to blame for that scar. Um, but be in an effort to mitigate against that, uh, all of my patients will start moving at three days. Uh, and that's something that, um, you know, Dr. McKinnon taught me. And uh, I think that getting that nerve gliding is the only way, aside from obviously meticulous surgical technique without beating up the nerve, without posting against the nerve as you use your tenotomies without huge wide spreads when you don't need huge wide spreads. You know, when you're dissecting on a nerve uh, to me and you're trying to free up that external epineurium or the mesoneurium around it, you just need to spread the width of the nerve, spread once see what you need to cut and then cut that tissue. Um, and that's when I can tell that our trainees have kind of mastered the cadence is when they're not doing huge wide spreads two or three times over the nerve and they're just, you know, spread, small spread cut, small spread cut. It makes me feel so good when I see them do that because I know that they understand, you know, how to be mindful of avoiding kind of those blunt, big moves that are going to cause scarring. I think that's really well said. And, and uh, I worked with a younger resident yesterday and, um, you know, it is a matter of, of applying your surgical technique in the right context. And I think that's what residents and all trainees learn and, you know, through the course of their training. And so, Wide spreads are appropriate in certain locations. Very, very meticulous spreads are appropriate in other locations. So I think you said that really, really well. Um, so just be clear, when do you send the patient to start their therapy? Uh, three days. So my protocol for these is I, I leave a drain, especially a revision. They come back at three days to see me um, in the office. We remove the drain and we send them to therapy. I'm fortunate enough to have great therapy partners who are in office um, who can fabricate splints um, and start them moving and gently initially, but just getting that nerve moving. Um, and then I will see them back in three weeks. Um, the sutures will typically come out at the therapist office. It's if it's with a therapist that uh, I work with routinely, um, which again, I'm fortunate enough to have that relationship. And um, that's just to make things more efficient in terms of office flow. How about what's your protocol? Yeah, I'm not sure anyone cares. They just want your protocol, but I'll share my protocol, then I'll share a pearl. Uh, so my protocol is they, my patients see therapy at five to seven days. Uh, there is no drain, although I deflate the tourniquet prior to final skin closure to minimize risk there. And knock on wood, have not had a major issue. I see them back at 12 days to take out stitches if I put in removable stitches and, and go from there. My pearl is for those of you who are starting a practice or considering a practice, whether it be nerve or anything, I think Chris has really done a few really smart things. And the main issue is we all want to build a practice that, you know, well, many of us want to build a practice that has a niche component, uh, something that really interests you, um, and whether that's congenital or sports or nerve or whatever. And I think what Chris has done really well is he has just said yes to all referrals. And so, you know, I'm sure Chris has no desire to see some of the patients I sent to him, but he's made it very clear that he will see anything and everything that's potentially nerve related. And that opens the door. It makes me really want to send him all patients, just like I know other people in the community uh, feel the same way. And so if you're building a practice, you can't be super selective to start. And I think Chris, you've done it that really well. And that's why you have a thriving nerve practice already. I appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, I guess one example of that is, you know, uh, just a very small uh, component is thoracic outlet syndrome. I believe a lot of thoracic outlet syndrome is treated non-operatively. Thoracic outlet syndrome is overdiagnosed um, or perhaps overtreated in a surgical manner, in my opinion. Do I love seeing thoracic outlet syndrome patients? Not in particular. It doesn't really bring me joy. You know, I like, I, I like honing my exam. 
Um, but it is something that in terms of if you look at it purely as a, you know, case to uh, new patient evaluation ratio payoff, not good because I don't operate a lot on these people. Um, they end up doing really well with their therapy colleagues, but I'll take the TOS referral because it'll get me the Plexus referral. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Um, and I feel like that's been the case because I've had some referring um, physicians, you know, from two or three hours away who have sent me TOS cases and then sent me a Plexus injury. So I will take all of those TOS cases just because I want to do the Plexus stuff. So. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Any uh, final comments as we close our first my hardest recent case segment. Well, I, you know, um, as they say at, at many podiums, nothing ruins a, a good surgery like follow up. So I want to see how this patient does over time whenever you can safely tell us. Uh, you know, that would be great to do an update. Maybe if we remind each other, we can update each other on the cases. So next time I'm on the hot seat for a hard case. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Outstanding. Well, have a great day. This was fun. And I look forward to the next recording. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.